everyone. Thank you for joining this panel session today. I'm Christian Smart, uh, General Manager of Travelzoo in Germany. Travelzoo is a global media company that publishes exclusive offers and experience to 30 million members. Our panel today is about um, recovery and technology in um, travel. We have two experts who I will be talking to about the experiences of how technology has changed over the last year and um, effects on industry and what role governments and tourism boards can um, play here. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Hello, Nick, and welcome. Um, Nick, um, you have a very broad um, experience for over 20 years in the, in the travel industry. Firstly, you were um, with international airlines and in the exhibition um, space, um, such as WTM. And um, now you work um, with um, in consulting and consulting uh, destinations on recovery plans. That's so right. thank you well, for taking very the much time. I appreciate it. Um, hello to London, um, here from Berlin. And um, Nick, tell me, what, what are your thoughts on um, what has changed on the digital side now, now during the, the pandemic? Well, it's been an amazing year to watch in terms of digital transformation. I mean, there's so many things have happened, but I think a few things that step out for me, stand out really, are the emphasis from a data point of view in terms of moving from lagging indicators to leading indicators, because predicting demand is so critical at the moment and, and, and hard to predict and changes all the time. So I think real focus on demand prediction, but also supply. I mean, would you believe in the UK at the moment, there are real shortages, nearly 200,000 jobs that are empty, shortages in the hospitality industry. The demand has come back, but the supply is slow to recover, and that's actually causing a real problem. So that'd be the first point I, I, I make. I think the second one is a theme, is the sort of seamless contact-free travel in airports, on board planes, including contactless in-flight entertainment, um, hotels, even cruises going beyond contactless payments. So I think that that contactless, touchless experience is just the new norm going forward in, in, in all segments of the travel industry. I think it's- uh, Nick, Nick what, what do you feel the future will hold? Um, um, so what are your predictions, let's say for the next 12 months in the, in the short and midterm um, for, the, for the industry? Yeah, I think a big change will be moving from the hard factors, which is where the battleground has been. So the hard factors I mean are things like borders being closed, you know, how long is the quarantine, when you're going to another destination, what's happening on that side, what's happening when you need to come back to your destination. I think the battleground is going to move away from that into the soft factors such as confidence, trust in travel suppliers, confidence that the borders are not going to close behind you, confidence that the, the destinations are COVID safe. So I think different segments are going to perform differently. I think the ones that have performed the best will be Visiting friends and relatives will be very resilient, short haul and long haul. I think that'll be a good segment, not that large, but very, very robust. Um, and luxury travel, I, I think, will be a boom segment, um, particularly for people looking for more space, um, proliferation of private jet travel. But I think areas such as business travel and mice will be very challenging for some time. You know, budgets are a problem. Some of the employers won't want their employees traveling outside of their home country. So I think there'll be a challenge and leisure will be mixed depending on where people can go. But I think everybody is desperate to get away. I mean, you know, I spend most of my time looking where on the map I want to go when things open up. So I think that's, uh, that's my outlook for the next 12 months or so. And where do you see the role um, of governments? How can, they, how can they support or tourism boards in particular um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the short term or longer term? To, to recover basically? What is their role? What are your recommendations given, given your, you're currently working in that field? Yeah, I spend a lot of time with tourism boards talking about exactly this, Christian. So I think the key is, this is what they are here for. They are here to make sure that their destination is open, mm -hmm. that their destination is safe. But most importantly, is to make sure that people can get to their destination. So working with airlines to make sure the routes come back online, the aircraft capacity is there but then to make sure that people know their destination is open. So I think the awareness and consideration on an international basis is critical and investment in that space. Now is the time to do that, to make sure that people know that they're open and also to describe why they should go to that destination. I mean, that the leading destinations of 2019 are probably not gonna be the leading destinations of future years because many things have changed. And actually, isn't it a great chance for these small, maybe unknown destinations 
to leap up the scale because maybe they offer something different. Maybe they offer some more personal space. Maybe they offer you know, less people, which is you know, very friendly to the new COVID world that we're in. So I think that, that announcing that you're open for business as a destination is critical, but also having a data-driven, flexible marketing campaign that you can target different markets at the right time when they're open to travel or when they're going to open so people can book in advance for those destinations. So I think that international promotion investment is critical right now. Okay, thank you. And um, from the from the Mice and Congress um, view, what is your your prediction or expectations? Let's say for like smaller events or for the bigger events um, like WTM um, or ITB, um, but also car shows. Um, what 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 would do you expect there? Yeah, so I think it's going to be challenging for some time. You know, business travel, which includes Mice, is predicted to potentially never return to the highs of 2019. So I think that things like Zoom, you know, like we're doing now and Teams is still there. So I think there are challenges around um, the opportunity or the switching that technology offers, but also budgets, you know, major corporations have saved a huge amount of money by not having business travel and you get used to those savings. So I think starting to spend again will be challenging. Um, some will come back, but I think it'll be tighter decision making on spending on events for sure. I think the, the stronger events will survive. Um, I think that will be fine because that's where the return on investment is, return on time to attend the events. I think the weaker ones will die. A lot of the smaller, weaker ones will disappear. But even the stronger ones will probably become more domestic, maybe a bit more regional in their attendance, which is why hybrid events will be here to stay, to reach those longer haul buyers and sellers um, for all of those events. I think one of the, the, the key things that's changed is that the buying season. You know, the buying season in travel is all about summer season, winter season. Well, that, that's all changed. I mean, imagine you're an airline network planner. You're trying to figure out where to put your aircraft next week, not next year. So I think that the seasonality is changing. So given that these events are, you know, they pop up for maybe three days a year, maybe more, maybe less, irrespective of their size, I think because of this changing the buying patterns, you'll see new all year round digital marketplaces come to life to service the travel industry, sort of complementary probably to the, the, the large events. Um, but I think that'll be quite a big change in terms of the buying patterns and how people go to market to buy. Perfect. Then thank you very much. Um, very um, valuable information from you. And thank you for your time, Nick. Well, it's my pleasure, Christian. Thank you for your time. It's great to be involved in this event. And I uh, look forward to seeing you and many of the other um, attendees soon. Perfect. Thank you. So hello, um, Dr. Baris Onai. Um, I'm very pleased um, to meet you. And um, you have a very broad experience over the past 15 years in um, um, tourism and events and international conferences in particular and um, trade shows. Um, so from, from your perspective, um, what, what, what has changed um, most in, in travel during the pandemic? Uh, for our business line, uh, for uh, exhibitions and conferences, uh, how it works is uh, we have buyers and sellers meeting at a certain spot around a specific topic, and they bring their goods and uh, they uh, have their meetings. And uh, for the great A, the biggest shows, the most important buyers and sellers are always international. The show might be in any city, let's say Munich, Frankfurt, doesn't matter, uh, but it's never only for the German economy or the Munich economy. It's for the world if it's big enough of, of a show. And uh, these types of events really rely very heavily on international travel. Uh, and so what happened over the pandemic, as we all know, all the events were canceled uh, and we could hold the events, but now it's slowly, slowly the world is coming back. But what the world that is coming back today is a very different world than what it was in back in 2019. Because right now there's a lot of strain on international travel. Uh, and you have to take tests and this and that, and the companies are still not very sure about their insurance policies. So the, the, the number of international visitors and exhibitors that we would normally have uh, is under a lot of stress. And that puts our industry uh, in a very tight spot because uh, the, uh, the price premiums that we will command, uh, are, they, they generally are built on this internationalization of the market, opening up the meeting of the world type events. And these now have a very hard time happening uh, because of uh, what's going on with the world of travel. We all know that uh, airlines, oh, 
first it starts from the uh, customer side. Yeah, all big companies are cutting international travel. I was uh, just looking at uh, the HSB, the boss of HSBC saying that he's going to cap their travel by 50%, the whole company. Yeah, uh, And Bill Gates said it too. He said uh, 50% of uh, business travel is not coming back. So there is a consensus that most business travel from 2019 will not come back. Uh, so for th that in mind, airlines will be cutting business seats and that's most of their profits. Uh, so basically it means economy will get a bit more expensive. So all, put all these things into an equation, we can find that the world of international events in 2019 might take much longer than expected to come back at full force. So that, that is the, uh, the main uh, change in our industry. From from um, a timeline, what would you expect um, to happen over the next uh, 12 months? I mean, we see it clearly now on the leisure side um, that it's picking up. Um, um, demand is back. Um, um, but what is your, your prediction, your forecast for the next 12 and let's say um, 12 months up to three years um, to recover? In, in our industry, the, uh, if we take 2019 as 100, 2020 was 28. The expectation for 21, the year we're in right now, is to reach the 50s. The expectation for 22 is to meet 70s and 80s, and 23 perhaps back to 2019. And if you adjust it by inflation, then it means you're actually down to 24, maybe 25, to meet 2019. So that is a very uh, long comeback. Uh, and, uh, but uh, on leisure, I agree with you because. Uh, If you're traveling uh, internationally, let's say for your uh, holiday for 15 days in a year, you will still do that. But if you were going to 10 business meetings in a year, maybe you're going to go to five and it will still be fine for your business. So that, that's the, 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 the major the break between leisure and business travel for us. So what role plays technology there in your, in your view? Uh, well, Before the pandemic, uh, every meeting was a face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah, uh, we would fly. Well, I you live. I live in London, and you would take the morning flight out to uh, I don't know Belgium, have two meetings, and fly back the same day. So that I I think uh, uh, has was a very sport position anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. because you would have you would just use your time and energy for a maybe two hour meeting. You would use your whole day. Yes. Now, what happened in the pandemic is because, as we all know, this is also recorded live uh, on video. Video <laughs> meetings are uh, the new norm. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I wrote a piece about this. If, if we put uh, the pinnacle of human interaction is face to face. And there is a, a theory around the media richness. Yeah. And the, the next thing down is a video. Because there's my sound, there's my video. Uh, but my gestures are maybe not coming through. You don't see my whole body and so on. And audio, you don't see my face, you just hear me. And then uh, something on an instant message, it's still a conversation, but you don't even hear me. So as we go down, yeah? The marginal utility of a face-to-face -face meeting over a video meeting is the big question now. What would it take for this meeting or any other meeting to be absolutely needs to be face-to-face. -face. What is it? What makes a meeting an absolute must face-to-face -face meeting versus a video meeting? Because a video meeting's cost in time and money is infinitely smaller than any face-to-face -face meeting, even if it's in the same city. I'm in London, if I was to travel to uh, uh, the city now, it would take me an hour to go on the tube and meet somebody for lunch in two hours and fly. So it, it's four or five hours of my time for a 20 minute meeting. So there are still meetings that require this, absolutely. Face-to-face -face is not going away. Face-to-face -face is uh, shifting in, from being a commodity into a premium product. That's what's changing. Because it was a commodity. You would use your personal face time for everything, right? But now you're saying, okay, a video is fine for 80% of what I'm doing, but for that 20%, I'm gonna be there in person. So um, what, what, what does, in your view, what can the governments, um, for example, do or tourism boards um, do to, to, to help to revitalize uh, the industry for, for recovery? Uh, I think uh, we need to look at uh, this, uh, uh, this strain of uh, premium, uh, let's say, model. 
uh, because face to face, I think will be a reserve going forward into the most important stuff, not for the 80% of what we're doing, yeah? For the 20% of what we're doing. But the world out there, as you're right, is built for 100, yeah? There is enough capacity in hotels and restaurants, bars and everything to accommodate everyone for a face-to-face -face for every type of meeting in the business world I'm talking about. So uh, we're looking at this from conference centers, from big conference hotels, from exhibition centers and usage capacities. And uh, we are going to see in a few years uh, that uh, there's going to be a, a shift in capacity usage of these venues. Uh, because uh, if I'm right, I might still be wrong, but if I'm right and uh, face face becomes the premium uh, uh, mode of interaction and video takes up a healthy portion of meetings, then those venues might find themselves in the uh, underutilized uh, position. But for the premium ones, how do you get those ones? And I uh, want to refer to a, a, a dear friend of mine from uh, Marina Bay Sands. And you know Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore? Oh. Uh, they built uh, a broadcast studio into their conference center. Because we know the world of uh, B2B events are going to be a hybrid uh, world. You're going to broadcast live from the event whilst the event is happening face-to-face -face at the same time. So they invested into a world-class TV uh, quality studio uh, so that events that are happening on Marina Bay Sands can utilize the studio. Now, that's a very clever thing to do. And I think that will uh, have a place in the world for, of conference centers going forward. They will, you will see they'll invest into infrastructure that will enable the future modality of events, which is hybrid. Uh, but it's not for every type of event, every type of venue, sorry. So some venues which are on the cheaper end of the spectrum might find themselves uh, a bit left out if premium meetings don't choose to be hosted there. Makes sense. I mean, we all attended uh, meetings this year and shows this year. I attended WTM. Um, and also ITB, and I've seen even the technology increasing over the time. So probably the ones that went first um, had the biggest challenges, and I completely agree that it will pick up over the time. Um, so, okay, then um, thank you very much for your valuable input, and um, I hope to see you soon in person. This was also virtual here now, and um, this will all come back, um, Baris. All right, my pleasure, Christian. Thank you. Stop.